Okay, you're all very welcome back. And our final session today is under the heading towards a rural regional sustainable society with real local participation. And our first speaker is Cara Augustenberg. Cara has spent over a decade working in academia in Ireland and the US conducting research on a wide range of environmental issues from water quality to bioenergy to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, she appears regularly in the media and blogs at the Verdant Yank. Uh, she's been active in the Irish environmental NGO sector through Friends of the Earth and is currently chairperson for Friends of the Earth's European Executive Committee. Cara Augustenberg. Thanks, Mick. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I, I, first, I want to start by thanking Social Justice Ireland because my expertise is actually climate change and environment. I, I have a PhD in environmental science and engineering, and it's very unusual to be invited to speak at a social justice conference. But what I would say is that this is a sign that Social Justice Ireland really connects the dots between environment and, and, and human rights. And while many of us in the environmental field work on environment because we simply love the beauty of nature and we think that every species has a, a right to exist on the planet in the same way we do, um, but there are also those of us who, who work on environment, and, and particularly um, in my case, because I am concerned about our dependency on environment. So the environment gives us many, what some refer to as ecosystem services, um, including food production. And of course, if we don't continue to manage those in a sustainable way, it, has, it eventually has a huge impact on us. So uh, that's the perspective that I personally am coming from. And, and briefly, I, I wrote a, a, a quite a comprehensive paper on some of the issues around sustainability and, um, and human rights and social justice issues that I think particularly affect Ireland and particularly affect where we're heading uh, now as, a, as the world, as part of our climate commitments. Um, but I want to summarize the solution to climate change in, in one sense, because I think climate change can be considered uh, quite overwhelming and everything we do uh, is, is impacts climate change and, it, and the solutions are very hard. So I like to put it in one sentence, which is that if we want to keep the world below what they call the two degrees safe level uh, of warming to maintain our current quality of life, um, in order to do this, to have a 50% chance of doing this, we have to keep 80% of our known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. So that's all the fossil fuel we already know we have. 80% uh, of that we have to keep in the ground. We can only burn 20% of it. And that also means there's no point in exploring for any more oil and gas because we can't burn that anyway. So that is overall the solution to climate change if we want to have any chance of staying below that, that safe level of two degrees. But there are a lot of benefits to doing this aside from, from just acting on climate, um, including more jobs. So right now in Europe, 97,000 people uh, have jobs in the solar field almost none of those in Ireland, not because we don't have sun, we actually have 80% uh, of the solar radiance of places like Italy, and we have an added advantage of natural rainfall to keep those solar panels clean, but the only reason we don't have solar jobs in Ireland is because our government hasn't set a price for solar, so they don't buy excess solar energy back from the grid. Um, so we are missing out on this rooftop revolution going on around the world. Um, and even in other renewable fields, so in, in the renewable sector in general, it's now employing six to eight million people globally. Um, so really, th this is an opportunity for more jobs, and I think some of the previous speakers talked about the advancements in technology actually having a negative impact on jobs, but when it comes to uh, low carbon technologies, there, there could be potential improvements in jobs. Um, another co-benefit is greater social equality. So, so one of our big issues in Ireland is fuel poverty, and certainly uh, creating warmer, healthier homes would, would alleviate some of that inequality and reduce people's fuel bills. So just recently, uh, Super Homes Ireland told me they are retrofitting uh, older homes to an A-rated standard, and they're taking taking energy bills in these homes that were three to four thousand euro a year and getting them down to three to four hundred euro a year. So you can imagine for an elderly person living in one of these homes, that's a considerable uh, impact on, on their their day-to-day -day lives. Another co-benefit is national security. So already we've saved one billion euro to date in um, the cost of imported fossil fuels because of the renewable energy that we have on stream. So as we continue to ramp up our renewable energy, um, this improves our national security in, in fuel, but we also need to think about our national security and dependency 
on foreign imports of food. So we import one ton of food per person per, uh, per year in this country, so we're heavily dependent on imports. And of course, as the climate continues to change in other parts of the world, that will, that will put us at greater risk. So addressing that issue of both fuel security and food security in order to, to address climate change would also help us for other reasons too. Um, agricultural production, I know, often is seen as a, a choice between acting on climate and, and actually increasing agricultural production, but there's evidence to show that uh, ad addressing climate would have positive benefits on agricultural production, including improvements in soil quality, uh, giving farmers new diverse ways of earning money, so, so, such as contributing to the bioenergy sector, or even uh, using their slurry for anaerobic digestion to create energy, um, and just diversifying their food system. So I think Anya will talk more about agriculture specifically, but you know, we have a new smart, or a, a relatively ongoing smart farming program between the EPA and the IFA now uh, that's showing that the, the farmers who've participated in that are saving on average 9,000 euros in cost savings, and they've reduced the greenhouse gas emissions by up to 10%. So there is evidence to show that low carbon farming is actually low cost farming too and can save farmers money. A final co-benefit would be public health. So recently a report came out saying that 1,600 people a year are dying in Ireland due to air quality issues, um, dying prematurely I should say, due to air quality issues and, and part of that is due to so burning solid fuels including peat and coal and even timber. And another part of that is due to agricultural emissions. And, and the final part of that is due to particulate matter from vehicles, particularly diesel vehicles. So to put that in perspective, uh, we lose 200 people a year now to road deaths. And we're losing 1,600 people a year due to air quality. So this is really a, a crisis we're not addressing. And certainly tackling uh, climate change, you know, creating cleaner energy, uh, cleaner ways of, 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 of creating energy would address that public health issue. They say in London, where this air quality issue is particularly severe now as a result of wood-burning stoves and diesel vehicles, um, if they move to a low-carbon society, they would save 5,000 lives a year. So that's considerable change. Um, there are a number of issues. I, I really feel that, that globally the page has turned on fossil fuels. So while it's not obvious here in Ireland, uh, if you look at where the rest of the world is going, um, they are getting off fossil fuels, with the exception of America now, obviously, as, as the only country in the world that isn't part of the, of the UN Paris Agreement. <laughs> Pardon? They haven't withdrawn yet. They haven't, yeah, they haven't withdrawn yet. Um, but anyway, but, but most of the world now is, is transforming and you know, companies like Apple and Google are only going to, to countries where they can get 100% renewable energy. So the business case is there to make this transition to. Um, so while our, our current political leadership is lacking on climate, uh, you know, the, the, the signs are there that the rest of the world will move in this way. I mean, every car manufacturer in the world now is working on electric vehicles, so that is happening. And there are a few issues I think we need to be mindful of from a social justice perspective as we make this, this low carbon transition. So uh, one of the quickest wins we can do to address climate change is actually retrofitting houses. And we could do that starting tomorrow if we in, in, invested in this and just making them more energy efficient. But we're looking at two million homes in need of retrofit here at a, an average cost of 28,000 euro per home. So that is a huge outlay for most people and not really viable. Even with the grants that are available, um, and there are lots of grants available that aren't being taken up uh, enough, and, and part of that is due to financing. So to even come up with the money to make this uh, energy retrofit is hard for most people. Um, we need to look at new creative ways of financing this, and perhaps that means getting credit unions involved. Uh, perhaps it also means that rather than expect individuals to retrofit their homes, we need to look at this at a, at a larger scale, perhaps roads or uh, entire estates or something uh, to create the economy of scale to make this viable. A second issue to be mindful of is, is the issue of community power, and, and this is where Ireland has really failed uh, to date. So, you know, our, our renewable energy thus far is largely uh, large-scale, developer-led, 
uh, very little to almost no benefit to the community. And, and this is something that Friends of the Earth has been campaigning on for a, a long time now, the idea that communities need to own their energy and need to have some control of that and some benefit from that. Um, this is the reason why in Germany 1.5 million homes have solar panels on their roofs because they can all sell their ele excess electricity back to the grid. And this is an opportunity that we, uh, the people of Ireland, are really missing out on strictly because of a policy decision on behalf of our government. Uh, a third issue is the development of a bioenergy sector. So we actually have a, a, a wonderful ecosystem for growing bioenergy in Ireland, and uh, we, ha we don't have that developing at any scale now, but we certainly could. Um, it's something we should encourage. However, the direction that it's going right now is that there are subsidies for bioenergy to put into the peat burning power stations only if 70% of the product is peat uh, and 30% is bioenergy and then, and then the peat burning power stations get to avail of this bioenergy subsidy. So it's a sneaky way of keeping the peat burning power stations open. Um, also too, m right now most of that bioenergy is imported, uh, things like palm kernels, cocoa husks and old growth timber from Canada. Um, products from Africa, and that is creating issues further afield, uh, issues around land grabbing, um, taking away pr productive land that could grow food from, from communities in places like Africa, um, and, and putting it toward bioenergy for us. So these are things we need to be mindful of as we develop a bioenergy sector in Ireland, that we cre can't create these other problems uh, further afield. Uh, another issue is climate smart agriculture. So there are opportunities, as I said before, for, for farmers to, to diversify. Right now, 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. And I think it's important to note that Chagas has said in peer-reviewed peer literature um, that, that Ireland should aspire to carbon neutrality in agriculture. And they have also said that the targets we have now around Food Harvest 2020 and food, Har food Wise 2025, which are geared to add over 300,000 new cows uh, to, to, to the herd size, um, are incompatible with our greenhouse gas target. So you know, these are two issues. We, ha we have a government that is steamrolling ahead in intensification of, of beef and dairy, despite the fact that farmers aren't particularly making much money out of this, um, and, and yet you know, the, the, it doesn't line up with our need to reduce emissions. So, so these are issues we really have to uh, come to terms with. And I, I think it's interesting that one of our leading IPC scientists, Professor John Sweeney, um, has, has done projections on what our future climate will look like in Ireland and what kind of crops will do well. For example, the potato crop will not do well here. But one thing he says will do well is that west of the Shannon will become an ideal place for growing maize, which uh, most of the, my family farmers in Kerry laugh at me when I said this. But, but this is something we should think about. What is a changing climate in Ireland and how will that affect our, what we can grow uh, in the future? Transport is, is a huge issue at the moment because our emissions as our economy improves are screaming upwards. I think the EPA has recently projected somewhere between a 12 and 20% increase in emissions by 2020. Now, we are a country where our greenhouse gas emissions are going up while the rest of Europe is going down. So this is why recently we were ranked as the worst country in Europe uh, for climate action from a, a group called German Watch and the Climate Action Network at the, at the Conference of Parties recently in the climate talks. Um, we need to electrify our transport system, and by that I'm not just talking about cars. We are doing quite well in our electric vehicle infrastructure. We're, we're leading the pack in terms of that infrastructure, but we also need to be electrifying our public transport or moving to biodiesel. And at the moment, instead, what we're finding is that Dublin bus is being rejected when they put forward ideas uh, or, or plans to change that infrastructure to biodiesel or electrification. Uh, instead, they're continuing to buy diesel buses because that's what they're getting funded for. So this is he also heading in the wrong direction. Uh, we also need to, to create disincentives for the purchase of diesel and SUVs. Right now, we, we buy more diesel vehicles than anywhere in Europe, while the rest of, of Europe, particularly places like Paris and London, are starting to ban diesel vehicles from their city because of the air quality issues. And what's happening is we're now becoming the dumping ground of diesel vehicles in Europe. So, so we're actually, the situation is getting even worse and our air quality is getting worse as a result. So, you know, it's important that we, we take away incentives for buying diesel and SUVs and we put them into incentives for electrification and for, particularly for development of sustainable transport. Uh, this evening there's a vigil going on outside the Dáil at 5.30 because two cyclists have died this week. 
um, in road fatalities, and it's uh, now a record-breaking year. So we've lost more people, uh, more cyclists to fatalities this year than at any year on record in Ireland. And I think part of that is because our government continues to incentivize these cycle-to-work programs, and yet doesn't create the inter infrastructure to make that safe. Um, so we need state-of-the-art infrastructure to get people out of cars and walking and into bikes. And of course, this has a co-benefit of addressing our obesity crisis and also addressing issues around mental health, revitalizing our, our high streets because cyclists actually shop more than people in cars. It's much easier to get off your bike and pop into a shop than it is to go find a parking space. So there are a lot of good reasons to, to invest in sustainable transport. At the moment, we're spending less than 1% of our transport budget on, on cycling and, and sustainable infrastructure. We should be spending around 10%. That, that's really best practice. Um, and the final point that I, I want to, to raise is around climate adaptation. So we, we really, um, we put very little thought into how Ireland will change as a result of climate change, though we do have evidence that sea levels are rising, uh, that many of our towns and cities are being threatened by flooding as a result of climate change and increased storms. There's now a 25% uh, increased risk of, of extreme storms on the west coast of Ireland. Um, you know, so we need to think about, do we do a planned retreat from low-lying low, low towns and villages? Uh, how do we address this? And we particularly need to address flooding. Um, our, our practice so far is this idea that we need to speed the water up and get it, get it down to the sea as fast as we can. Um, I, I did my doctoral research in Los Angeles, and, and they had the same idea once upon a time. And in fact, they put concrete channels in all of the rivers. Uh, so you may remember, if you've ever watched The Terminator, that scene where, where there's a car chase going through this concrete channeled river. Um, that's how all the rivers were. They thought it was a great idea to be able to develop the city. Um, in fact, now they're tearing them all out because they realize it was a complete disaster. It's very, very dangerous. The water just you know, accelerates down. It actually has killed a lot of people who get caught in the in these floodwaters. Uh, now they realize what they should be doing is slowing that water down upstream. And we're seeing places like Pont Bren and Pickering over in the UK, where they're working with farmers further upstream to build extra hedgerows, uh, to sacrifice parts of their fields in winter and pay farmers to sacrifice those fields to protect the residents living downstream and, and slow that water down. And that is working. So those softer engineering um, operations are things we need to consider rather than the, the hardscaping that we've been traditionally conditioned to, to bear in mind. Uh, finally, I just want to say that um, this, that from our point of view in the, in the environmental NGO sector, that this last couple of years has really been unprecedented, and that is because of new politics. So up until now, it's been very, very hard to, to get environmental legislation through. It took Friends of the Earth 10 years to, to get a, uh, any kind of climate legislation through, and, and what ended up uh, getting through was quite watered down from what was originally proposed. But recently, we, we've been able to support a, a national ban on fracking. We've been able to support a, a, a divestment bill, so we're going to divest the strategic investment from, from fossil fuels. If, if that happens, Ireland will become the first country in the world to do this. Um, so so this, is, this is really a historic moment. We're now looking at a waste reduction bill brought forward by the Green Party and Labour that's in its third stage. But we've seen more environmental legislation pass through the doll or, or come coming through the doll in the last year than, than, than any time I've certainly lived in Ireland since 2003. And I, I really do think this is a result of new politics. Um, the divestment bill was brought forward by an independent, uh, Thomas Pringle, who said he never would have been able to bring this bill forward before. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for us, and, and, and I hope it will last uh, as long as possible so we can ad advance more of these kind of proactive environmental issues. Also, too, we've seen the Citizens' Assembly recently consider climate change over two weekends. It was the first time they, they took two weekends to consider uh, such an issue. And they came up with 13 really strong recommendations. Unfortunately, the media kind of picked up on, on the agriculture one and that they wanted farmers tax more. But what they didn't really raise was that, was that the citizens themselves actually said that they, too, were willing to pay more for high carbon activities, that they think across the board in every sector we should pay pay for high carbon, high polluting activities through our taxes, and we should be rewarded for low carbon activities. And they said the same thing about agriculture.
agriculture, that agriculture should be rewarded and incentivized for low carbon activities. Um, I think it shows that when given the opportunity to really consider the issues in an unbiased way, citizens see that there is an urgent need to act, that Ireland is not leading, and that this is an important issue for them that they are willing to pay to address. And that, that sends a huge message to our political leadership um, who often say that the reason they don't address climate change is because it's not a doorstep issue and people don't care. But when given the, the facts, they, they actually do care. Um, and finally, I, I would mention that this, this concept of bringing people along in this low carbon transition, which is the next industrial revolution, it, it, I mean, we are living in a time now where in the next 30 years, we should see society transformed, completely taken off of fossil fuels, and it will be a completely different world than the, wor than the world we're living in today. So it's a very exciting time, but, but in order to make it happen, we need to bring people along, and that is the point of this new National Dialogue on Climate Action, um, which was launched about six months ago. I'm on the advisory council of that, and, and we're just beginning the process of coming up with these regional workshops to bring people along and get get citizens actually informing policy on you know, how do we make this change? What are the things we need to do at the local level to actually make the low carbon transition in a timely fashion? Thank you. Uh, thanks, 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 Cara. Just before I introduce our next speaker, I neglected to say prior to Cara's address that you'll notice that there are evaluation forms now placed on all your seats and we'd really appreciate if you could give some feedback on today's conference. Okay, thanks. The next speaker is Anya Macken, Anya Macken Walsh from Chagas. Anya is a research officer at Chagas's Rural Economy and Development Programme. Her primary interests are in cultural sociology and with a specific focus on agriculture. She is an adjunct lecturer at the School of Political Science and Sociology in NUI Galway. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you to Social Justice Ireland in particular for the speech here today. Uh, I must apologise in advance, I'm slightly hoarse and I have a cough, but uh, fingers crossed all will go well with my voice. The title of my presentation today, and I was asked today specifically to speak about the urban rural divide. And within that broad topic, I'm going to speak and I'm going to focus on this divide through a lens of development opportunity. And this development opportunity actually depends on that divide, on a divide of sorts, on the different functions of ur urban and rural space and the complementary needs of rural populations and urban populations. And the vision of a rural economy that in addition to the production of, rural agri of agricultural commodities, a rural economy that delivers products and services that are culturally, socially, and environmentally meaningful and valued to urban-based consumers has already been articulated very well by policy, particularly at the EU level. In fact, policies have already been designed and implemented to achieve that vision. But what I'm going to focus on today over the next 15 minutes is how these policies have fared out and how the type of social contract discussed by Social Justice Ireland and Sean Healy in his presentation today, a contract of citizens' rights and responsibilities, how such a contract has failed to emerge between Irish, rural and urban societies. And after I do that, I'm going to identify four key themes that help us to critically analyse our current situation so that we can better confront the challenge of charting progress towards building such a uh, social contract in the future. So by the late 1980s in Ireland, problems had officially reached crisis proportions in rural areas of the EU. In Ireland, for example, and these were problems that were replicated throughout the EU, Carney and colleagues documented the presence of rural population decline, polluting effects of intensive agriculture, declining numbers at work in agriculture, etc. In response to these problems, a very important document, The Future of Rural Society, was one of the first documents to set out a new revised vision for rural areas. And while it was envisaged, of course, that many farms, larger and more productively efficient farms, 
were to continue to produce agricultural commodities in, a, in an environmentally friendly way. For other farms that were officially categorised as economically unviable, a, what's called a culture economy approach was proposed. The culture economy approach, as defined by Mary Cawley and Desmond Gilmore some time ago, is an approach for capitalising on the distinctive features of rural areas and cultural practices as an alternative to pursuing scale economies in production. And real participation, and Sarah will speak about this after me, real citizen participation was a core feature of how this culture economy could be achieved. But there were very pragmatic reasons for this, not just democratic reasons. The EU leader programme, for instance, which was a primary policy instrument for the culture economy, it involved a partnership approach. It was defined by this approach, involving partnerships between actors from the private, voluntary, and public sectors, working together. And this was an approach that was considered capable, in no other way, of exploiting opportunities in a more integrative, uh, integrated and innovative way that would be beyond the capabilities of one sectoral actor operating alone. And the second hallmark characteristic of the EU leader programme was that it subscribed to the principle of sub subsidiarity. And in doing so, it could tap into local knowledges and perspective. And this was assumed to give rise to a more locally appropriate development approach and a development that, and, and development that focused on unique local resources for the culture economy. And the whole of this approach, the whole of the new vision for rural areas, was identified as having emancipatory qualities for society as a whole. Rural well-being and urban well-being. For producers, in the, in the words of Philip Lowe and colleagues, the culture economy approach was claimed to have the capacity to raise local consciousness of territorial identity and raise confidence in the ability of the areas themselves to regenerate themselves. And for consumers, on the other, other hand, rural cultural products and services were described by Scott and colleagues as operating at the level of the aesthetic and the spiritual, the symbolic and the social. And as we have heard already today and from Cara, many citizens not only want to access locally produced food for its organoleptic or their, its taste quality, but in the, in the words of Luke Dilly, they wish to literally eat their way into green identities, demonstrating through their purchases commitment to issues such as food sovereignty and climate change. So now that we know what the new rural development vision was, what has actually happened since the 1980s? As a starting point, one of the key conclusions from research in Ireland and right across Europe is that engagement of, on the part of farmers and other indigenous groups such as indigenous fishers has been very low. So these statistics are presented and explained in the conference proceedings. I just have time to run through them quite quickly here. But statistics show that just 4% of Irish farms have engaged in any type of diversification activity, with just 0.4% of farms undertaking food processing. As this slide shows, the market income for most cattle and sheep farms is negative which means that they receive less than the cost of production in the market. And while dairy farms are more profitable, many of them much more profitable, beef and sheep farms comprise over 80% of Irish farms. For the 37% of Irish farms who fall into the category of a small farm, 38% of them describe farming as their main occupation. And you can see family farm income for those farms there. 2,917 euro. A profile of these farms was recently published by Chagas National Farm Survey, and one characteristic is that nitrogen and phosphorus balances on a per hectare basis are lower on smaller farms than on larger farms, and that the systems on smaller farms are low input. Per hectare, smaller farms emit fewer greenhouse gas emissions, which is directly related to their low level of meat output. 
and their uh, extensive nature. Another part of the picture of agriculture in Ireland is that the number of farms is decreasing and their size is generally increasing. Now this type of trend is far more rapidly occurring in other countries, particularly the United States. But at the EU level, Ireland, com by comparison to EU member states, is highly populated by small farms. So of course, as we can see from this graph, this map, there is a, a, a fairly wide representation of all of, of small farms right across Europe. But all of Ireland fits into the category of a predominantly agricultural region. So that briefly is a picture of how agriculture has fared out since policies for a new rural economy were launched uh, 30 years ago. But that is not the whole picture, of course. The alternative rural economy, the cultural economy, has grown o over that period of time. And while that is a whole other study, Hilary Tovey, the Irish sociologist, she identifies the pioneers in that cultural economy movement and in the local food movement in particular. And she acknowledges the con contributions of women, ex-urbanites and immigrants in particular. She says, pioneers of local food movements include American, German, Swiss, English and Irish ex-urbanites, women who had married into farming and fishing families and returned Irish emigrants. And all indications are, when, when it looks at the profile of the cultural economy projects, for example, the Wild Atlantic Way, these initiatives are growing. And while there are multiple inspiring individual examples of farms that have integrated, and fishing households, that have integrated to local food economies and the cultural economy, there remains little or no evidence whatsoever that a mass movement will take place to address the farm viability crisis. And we must remember that addressing that crisis was the original intention of programmes such as LEADER. There is no doubt about that. Farmers remain the main landholders in rural areas, indigenous farmers, not only in Ireland, but across Europe and many regions of the world. And currently, a very significant proportion of Irish farms are in a situation where they are neither in the category of the economically productive large-scale farm nor the profitable boutique artisan producer. They are what Fred Kirshenman calls in the death zone. And does that matter to society? Where do you think farmers should be encouraged to go in this quadrant? Where does the citizen think the farmer should go? Where does the policymaker think the farmer should go? And then within that category of citizens, what is the view of the family farm? And we must think very critically about the situation, the nature of the current situation. What has happened and why? And philosophy, as the President Higgins reminded us this morning, cannot assist us in understanding and critically reflecting on our current situation. So I'm going to present four themes that have been uh, I explored through the, through the lens of the literature on philosophy. The first and most obvious theme in helping to us to understand this situation are the rules of the game. Although leader is implemented through a partnership approach, the literature on power reminds us that structures and institutions, even local partnerships, they are always goal specific and actor specific. So what this means in practice is that all development programs, all institutions, almost by de definition, they have, they have a specific mandate. They have an exclusive mandate. They do not have a carte blanche. And we know that institutions and development programs are in fact not even supposed to have overlapping uh, functions. And in such a context, if nothing else, the citizen must be conscious of the interests and the actors that are organised into and out of certain institutions and be conscious of the way in which some of these institutions can almost inevitably come to stand in opposition to each other, such as the farming lobby in, in, in cases and the environmental lobby. That's one very clear example. But what are the consequences for these types of oppositions? 
for society and for social dialogue. And it's important for the active citizen to be conscious of the spaces in between these institutions and the people within those spaces that may not be, who may not be represented by any institution at all. In this respect, the relatively small indigenous family farm falls between many stools. And there is a prevailing view in agricultural institutions in the private, public and third sectors that small farms are unproductive, that they are taking up the land, that they are an obstacle to the expansion of other farms who would farm the land more productively, and that they are an obstacle to those who would, in their place, successfully create an artisan boutique business. That is the prevailing view, and it is important that we are aware of that view. And if the recommendation for farms that are economically vulnerable to enter into the cult cultural economy, if that is the, the recommendation to these farms, we must be aware of the nature of the challenge that this presents. And the challenge, as described by sociologist Christopher Ray, is the replacement of material and labour value with design value. That's the definition of the challenge that he put forward, and I think it's a very good one. For farmers transitioning from mainstream agriculture into the cultural economy, this may not be easy or desirable. The knowledges and occupational practices required for the types of design-centred, consumer-focused enterprises, these are entirely different to the practices and the knowledges required for agriculture, for land and animal husbandry. While from a profit maximization perspective, recalling President Higgins' presentation today, it might seem rational that an indigenous farmer would be incentivized to either sell or reinvent a loss-making farm, particularly when land is valuable in the marketplace. But we know from research that the family farm has a different perspective on things, that it values more than anything receiving the land, not just the land, but the farm as a living entity from previous generations, improving it in so far as they can, and, poop, and passing it on. And the family farm has actually been very, very good at that. It has been very tenacious and resilient. Less than 1% of farmland is sold on the annual market, on the open ma market. And Anne Byrne at NUI Galway, a sociologist at NUI Galway, would advise us to examine the resilient strategies of farm families. And she would ask, is there anything that we as citizens, as policymakers, can learn from their strategies when it comes to sustainability? A third theme is that philosophy tells us that cultural economies are often driven by forces of consumerism, not by production. Hilary Tovey, for example, in her research on food movements in Ireland, found that some of the most prominent local food actors and lobbyists, even if they are farmers or growers, actually see themselves as part of a consumer movement rather than a producer movement. That's just the way the institutions have developed, the movements have developed. And where Irish food culture is concerned, Irish is identified in contrast to many other EU countries as being without a food culture. That is what's written uh, uh, without a strong local food culture. That is what's written in the literature. And in addition to that, there can be a sense of socio-cultural shame surrounding Irish food. And this is a theme that has been very well explored by artist Deirdre O'Mahony's Spud project here. These are potato ridges grown in the lawn of the Irish Museum of Modern Art. And there are implications arising from this for how we, as policymakers, as development workers, expect the local food, food movements to materialise in Irish rural areas. For who is involved, who becomes involved in, 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 these local, in these local food movements? And in the Irish case, developing a local differentiated food economy can involve, in some instance, reinvigorating tradition, which is standard across many examples of the cultural economy. But in many cases, more problematically, it can e involve a redesign of tradition, or even a distancing from tradition. And we've found that in research. But leaving aside the Irish mo uh, context for a moment, this is, 
the, uh, these are trends and these are observations in research about the cultural economy in urban and rural areas across the world. Philosophy warns us against the obscuring of production by consumption. In particular, Andy Pratt, apologies, cautions against consumption becoming spectacularized, he said, and artificially separated from the reality of production and producers. Untethered from production, the cultural economy becomes generated, in fact, by conformities rather than diversities, demonstrating what Charles Taylor called <coughs> absurd conformities among institutions and actors and products and movements striving to be authentically different. And we can see conformity, international conformity, in local food movements. Research, as well as industry sources, industry records, confirm that you're actually more likely to find sun-dried tomatoes at an Irish local food or farmer's market rather than meat from a local farmer. And as the sociologist Sally Shortall reminds us, it cannot be assumed that to participate is the default position or the social norm, or that non-participation is, is exclusion. The 5.8 million or more peasant farmers across Europe have shown tenacity and they have proven resistance to what are officially now recognised, quoting van der Plug, as the disastrous effect of integration to the dominant modernisation model. But also in the context of the new cultural economies, or what were new in the 1980s, dominated by consumer trends. The farmer also has been protective, somewhat paradoxically, of cultural diversity. Because in the words of Irish sociologist Anne Byrne, when indigenous inhabitants, indigenous inhabitants gradually abandon local criteria re regulating forms of reasonable thought and feeling, they will have become much more similar to people everywhere else. And should that happen, and should these farmers conform to whatever development model is proposed to them? To quote Andy Pratt, Cultural diversity is parallel in many senses to the notion of environmental diversity, in that it is a resource that we cannot know when it will be useful until it is lost, and once lost, it is impossible to recover. And in this context, we must recognise the powerful roles of the peasantry in civil society, offering the pockets of resistance that were described earlier by President Higgins. So I'll, I'll conclude by asking what for the future. On the basis of a very extensive study across Europe conducted by Sofia Davidova for the European Commission, she identified three main paths for small farms in Europe. Disappearance due to absorption into larger farms or land abandonment. Transformation into small commercial farms. Continuation as they are through a diversification <coughs> slightly altered, off-farm employment, which the vast majority of uh, Irish dry stock farms are doing currently, or forced re-entry due to lack of options, which is quite a dismal picture. There is little doubt that at least some of the quite large cohort of economically vulnerable farm farms in Ireland will follow these various pathways, but an alternative route is possible for Ireland. Advocates of a particular agricultural development model called the agriculture of the middle model emphasise that there is a burgeoning market demand for local foods. These foods are neither cheap commodity foods or luxury expensive foods that can be quite unaffordable for people. They are somewhere in the middle of these two categories and they're produced in accordance with sustainable agriculture standards. standards. And the people leading this movement, which has gained traction, they ask us to imagine a large number of small and mid-sized family farmers linked together in a marketing network, producing food products for regional food sheds, using sound conservation practices, providing their animals with the opportunity to perform all their nat natural functions, preserving the identity of such food products, and making them available in the marketplace with opportunities for consumers to access the entire story 
of the product's life cycle using existing food service delivery systems. And that last part is very important. A forging of the immense respective powers of farmers on one hand and consumers on the other in the rural-urban interchange is necessary for this. Going beyond partnerships, area-based partnerships, to a national social contract model, which Social Justice Ireland reminds us is predicated not only upon citizens' rights, but citizens' responsibilities. But for this, cognitive liberation is required. Lingering influences in institutional cultures of policies that value economies of scale, derisory attitudes towards the small farmer. These, these issues must be acknowledged and then mediated through new cultural conversations involving rural and urban societies equally. Institutionalised divisions between rural development, productive agriculture and ecological citizenship, these much must be broached. The inculcation of a hegemonic rural masculine culture in an agriculture that remains partially, at least in industrialisation mode, with constraints arising for the human potential of both men and women must be addressed. And the sense of mystification surrounding power imbalances in the food chain, described by President Higgins, where many citizens avert their gaze, creating what he called a plague of indifference, must be broken. The multiple values embodied by farm produce must be appraised in the public sphere, and for this, citizens must be empowered to think critically, drawing from philosophy, to again quote President Higgins, to discriminate between truthful language and illusory rhetoric. Thank you. Anya, thank you very much for that paper. Uh, now, our final speaker on this team is uh, Sarah Burke from Social Justice Ireland. Thanks, Michael. And if I can get this, I think something has not. Something doesn't seem to be connecting here. Oh, hang on. It's great, I did the technology for everybody else all day, and it doesn't work for me in the end. <laughs> okay. Okay, so thank you very much for everybody, and congratulations on staying through, staying it through to the end. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the public participation networks, because I realise we're under a little bit of time pressure. But there is a paper in the book which has quite a bit of detail in it if you have a particular interest in some of the stuff that I may whiz through. So just to come back to the, I suppose, the framework, and it's been referred to a number of times, that we're talking about a principle of subsidiarity, where decisions should be made as close to the people affected as possible. And in terms of the Irish people and the state, that is local government in Ireland, the city and county councils. And we're looking at aiming towards a deliberative democracy process, which again has been discussed a lot today, where people can sit down, assess evidence, leaving aside power differentials, and create decisions which are for the common good and not for any particular vested interests. And this is this sort of this equal, um, this equal idea. Now, before going any further, I want to talk a little bit about volunteering and active citizenship, because one very strong element of participation within this country is the participation as volunteers that so many people have in society. In fact, there's about half a million people in Ireland who volunteer in organisations of one sort or another. And that volunteering brings a huge development to, uh, to us socially, environmentally, culturally, economically, all of those areas which are so important. An economic value has been put on volunteering in Ireland, which I think is an absolutely gross underestimate because they're estimating the skill set of the minimum wage and the skill set of volunteers in Ireland is way above the minimum wage. But at minimum wage, you're talking about a billion euros contributed to Ireland. And in the UK, they did an estimate that it was 1.5% of GDP. 
And what that does to an extent is to recognise the skills and the expertise that volunteers have, to recognise that volunteers are working at the grassroots, have an awareness of the issues that affect people on the ground because they are those people on the ground. And as such, that expertise should be harnessed in policy and decision making. And as we talk about local government, as you know, there was a local government reform programme instigated by Phil Hogan in 2012, which was eventually put into practice in 2014. And as part of that, he set up a task group on citizen engagement in, in late 2013, which was chaired by Sean Healy of Social Justice Ireland and participated in by many other people. And they were asked to come up with a framework for how you would get public engagement within the local authority system. And they came up with this concept of public participation networks. And those networks were rolled out after the June 2014 elections, the local elections which took place then. So what is a PPN? A PPN is a collective of volunteer-led organisations. And we say a collective because it's non-hierarchical, it's a flat structure, and it aims to have equality between all groups and all members. And what you have is about a fifth, about 20% of groups are those dealing with issues of social inclusion. And there's some of them there issue supporting people who are elderly and vulnerable, supporting people with disabilities, elements of family support, community development, anti-poverty work, etc. About 5% of members, but this is rising, you'll be glad to hear, are environmental groups. And those environmental groups will be dealing with many of the issues which Cara has alluded to um, earlier, including looking at community energy cooperatives and those types of groups, which um, are obviously to be encouraged. And the remaining 75% of members are what we would call general community and voluntary groups. And you can see there the huge spread of activities. And let's remember as we sit here in this stadium, that this is a stadium built by a voluntary organisation. The biggest stadium in the country, I think the fourth biggest or something in, uh, in Europe, which proves the value of volunteering and volunteer-led activities. That's one level of the achievement. Equally important is the group of people who do Meals on Wheels for elderly citizens within an area enabling to, them to stay in their, own, in their own homes. All part of the spectrum of activity. So, countrywide there are 31 PPNs because there are 31 local authorities. That is, in case everybody, anybody's trying to figure out what the story is, there are four local authorities in Dublin, two in Galway and two in Cork. Each of them has between 100 and 1,000 member groups, and we reckon there's about 12,000 groups countrywide. And if you take an average, there's 21, 22 people in each of those groups. That means that you have a quarter of a million people who are connected in some way with a public participation network. And that is the huge opportunity and potential of public participation networks. And the idea is that they are the main point of engagement of the community with the local authority. And that's a double pointing arrow for a reason. Not, it's not a not equal sign. It means we're talking about communication in both directions, from the local authorities to communities and from communities to the local authorities. So, what does a PPN do? This is all lovely, they all get together. What do they do? There are three main functions, and I'm actually going to flip to a picture because that, those words are in your... Um, are in your packs. Basically, an effective PPN will be focusing on the well-being of this and future generations, and the concept of well-being has been well espoused on various papers this evening and the importance of it. And they're involved in three activities. One is participation in decision-making and policy within the local authority catchment. The second is via building the capacity or training and supporting the organisations, both training and supporting them to be able to participate in policy development effectively 
and also supporting them within their own work through setting up peer learning networks, uh, various training programmes, etc. And the third area is through information sharing between the local authority and the community groups, between the community groups themselves. And the, by bringing these three together and with every three-legged stool, you knock off one leg, the whole thing collapses. So what are the opportunities for participation in decision-making in local authorities? There are public consultations on plans and proposals, as you would have at national level. And I, I was kind of amused watching Manuel Munoz's monkeys there with their cucumber and grapes earlier, because I think there is a situation here where people will input public plans and consultations once, and if they don't get a response, they may input once more. But a bit like the guy who is getting pretty cheesed off to be polite about his uh, cucumbers, a point will come where unless there is a positive and consistent response coming back from the body which is being consulted with, and people can see that there is a point to them putting in their input, they will not continue to do it. And that is the challenge which is out there. Communities are open and willing to, to engage. The issue is to be able to see a positive response to that engagement. The second space is seats on local authority advisory and decision-making committees. So local authorities have a whole range of different committees there. You can, they're there, go back. Um, and all community, social inclusion, and environmental representatives on those bodies must come through the public participation network. So this puts both a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity on PPNs because they are sitting on these bodies along with the other social partners, be they farming interests, fishing interests, business um, uh, unions, etc. Now, one of the things about PPNs which is slightly different is that they have a structure called linkage groups because the idea is that if a representative goes forward onto a local authority committee, that they're not just going there representing their own personal views or that of the group that they come from themselves. They need to be representing the PPN as a whole. So the idea is that a linkage group is established which would be the stakeholders in a policy area. So let's say it was the Joint Policing Committee. You would bring together all of the groups in an area which had a specific interest in safety and security issues. And they would identify their issues. They would elect and support their representative onto the Joint Policing Committee, who would then feed back to them on what was going on on the Joint Policing Committee. So in this way, you're building knowledge, you're building awareness, you're building capacity amongst a wide number of groups on what happens in terms of policy and the Joint Policing Committee. So again, here's your group sitting up, having the ideas, then working with a representative who brings forward those ideas to a board or committee. And what you don't have is somebody going out with no direction and no knowledge of where they're going. So if you have a representative, that representative is bringing forward the views of others and bringing forward the diversity of those views as well. So if there are some conflicting views, the representative must bring forward both. So that's great and that's lovely in, in theory, but what would we mark it against? What might we benchmark it against? What might we look at it against? Unfortunately, the Council of Europe produced a code a number of years ago for participation. And they looked at four distinct levels in terms of participation and um, ranging from basic information sharing, we'll tell you what we're doing, through consultation, we'll tell you what we're doing and we ask you what, we, what you think of it, but we may or may not take on board those views, through to the final one, which would be real co-creation and partnership as the leader programme was originally designed to do. Now, I think how it's actually ended up may be a little different at this stage, but how that was originally designed to do. 
They also talk about a number of criteria for, 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 the, for real public participation. And I think the one that I'll just highlight in that is the one saying to seek out people who are traditionally excluded from decision making. To seek out people who are impacted but whose voices are often not heard. And that's really important. Policy is an iterative process. You go around the cycle, as we all know, going from originally setting the agenda right around to monitoring and evaluation. And communities should be involved at every single stage of that process because far too often what happens is a decision is made and the response of communities is reactive to that. We don't like it, we hate it, we're angry, what are they doing to us? And you immediately have this breakdown of trust, poor communication, none of which leads to a good negotiated solution. So it's really important that the, the development process is open to people at that earlier stage. So how are the PPNs doing against those kind of criteria? Where are we now? Now, before I put this, there were I two other slides there which I referred to in the presentation that I've taken out for, for time. The one thing I'd like people to appreciate is that the development of PPNs has not been a completely smooth and easy process. And while they've been in existence for three and a half years, the vast majority for various funding and resourcing and other reasons have only been really effective for the last maybe year and a half, maybe two years. So they're very much toddlers and they're very much a work in progress. But given that, where are we? In our 31 PPNs, we now have about 800 PPN representatives sitting on about 300 committees, bringing that community social inclusion environmental voice to, the, to that table. There is very strong capacity building going on out there. There's very strong information sharing going on out there. PPNs are building good interagency links with organisations that are active on the ground like HSE, education and training boards, etc. So they're really starting to be movers at a local level. They're recognised very much at a national level as well and starting to be noted in national policy about consultation should happen, consultation should happen via PPNs and this is really welcome. There's very good support from the department and I'm delighted to see that there are people here from the Department of Rural and Community uh, Development um, at the moment and the department have been staunch in their support of the PPNs as they're continuing to develop. And because communities are this, PPNs are innovative and creative and diverse and one size fits all and they're all at different stages of development and they're all developing to meet the needs of their communities, whether that's in rural Kerry or urban Cork City. And we've got where we are because of an awful lot of hard work and de dedication from secretariats, who are the volunteers who administer the PPNs, workers, each PPN has a resource worker, and the local authorities, the department, and other actors. So it's been really, really, really hard work to have got us to this place where we are now. So in terms of the European matrix, how are we doing? Okay, information, very good. Consultation, good. PPNs are being consulted. Some uh, proviso about how much feedback is coming. Broad collaborative dialogue is happening in some spaces. There are quite a number of PPN representatives who feel they do sit in an equal way at a table, can bring forward their views in a very equal way and are listened to. Others do not have that experience. In terms of co-creation and partnership, it's one tick and it's a little one. Because really, we're not, we're not there yet. But then again, the PPNs are an evolving structure and it would be surprising if they suddenly catapulted 
to co-creation and partnership within two and a half, three years. So it really is a question of this is a work in progress. So what are the issues? For local authorities, one of the issues is the centralised nature of Irish policy making. We are one of the most centrally governed countries in, in Europe and local authority powers are limited in many cases. There is also an issue with building local authority understanding of participation right across all divisions from the, road, the people dealing with roads to the people dealing with water to the people dealing with community. <coughs> and developing participation friendly structures. And as with most statutory organisation, there's a need for a bit of a culture change to move to being truly open to participation and truly open to the idea of co-creating services. We have a little bit of a way to go. But progress is being made. On the side of the PPNs, come on, come on little machine. There is an issue, there's still an issue around the capacity building of building some trust from grassroots groups who may have had a bad experience before in engaging groups in policy. And as the president put it much more eloquently than this, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but he talked about consultation and volunteer fatigue and the need to address that and make participation worthwhile for people. Sometimes it's difficult for representatives to be proactive on committees. They often find themselves reacting to proposals being brought by somebody else rather than being able to bring proposals themselves. But again, this is a matter of capacity building and time. There are challenges in rural areas. I was talking to a guy from Kerry recently and he told me that the average distance tra time travelled by people to a meeting in Kerry is an hour and a half each way and that's the average distance because of the size of the county no matter where they situate the meeting. <coughs> and that's an issue around participation and we all know about rural broadband. PPNs need a stronger national profile, they're kind of a best kept secret. As a matter of interest, how many people here had heard of PPNs before this? <laughs> okay, excellent, I'm pleasantly surprised, I'm pleasantly surprised. And I know there are some people here who are very involved in their own PPNs. And PPNs, I suppose, as a victim of their own successes, because now more and more groups are looking for consultation and input from the PPNs, that's putting extra demands on PPNs which have one worker, and that's basically it, to run operations in an entire county, perhaps with five or six hundred member groups, we are starting to have a need for further resources to go into the PPNs. And eventually this thing is going to work. Yes, got it. Okay, final slide you'll be glad to know. So we have a vision in terms of going forwards, and we're talking about after 2019, the next gen local elections. The PPNs have a really good, consistent and adequate budget resources and support. That they're operating as they should with all those good things that are up there. That there's real ownership by the member groups and they can act proactively to influence policy and the door is open to them that local authorities recognise the value of the deliberative approach and that sometimes the deliberative approach takes time and that they can allocate time and that we can stop this ridiculous rush that we have here that we must make quick decisions because leadership is making quick decisions which acts against any sort of deliberative process. That we start seeing a rebuilding of some of the trust which has been broken at local levels. And we move towards that partnership and co creation. And in that way, it will start leading towards genuine engagement between people in the state at a local government level. PPNs aren't perfect, but they're there, they're embedded, and they need to be supported because they have the potential to really support engagement of people with local government. Thank you.
Sarah, thank you very much for that, uh, the concluding address we have today. Just in terms of our final session there, our theme towards a rural, regional, sustainable society, real local participation, Cara Aug Augustenberg and Anya McEnwalsh and Sarah Burke, thank you all very much. Folks, unfortunately, the clock has caught up with us in terms of any Q&A at this session, and we're also slightly constrained in that the um, Social Justice Ireland AGM is taking place in approximately 15 minutes. So with that, I'd um, invite Sean Healy to come back and close today's uh, policy conference. First, I have to say, I don't know about you, but I thought we had some fantastic papers there, and certainly... Uh, food for thought that will certainly keep us going well beyond Christmas anyway at this rate. Uh, I suppose you, you've said the most important thing, Mick. Uh, I, th I think it's been a wonderful conference. Uh, this is the 30th conference we've run. Uh, we've run every year since 1988, so uh, it's an, uh, looking back on it, we're kind of stunned, a bit stunned ourselves. Uh, but this is certainly one of the best, if not the very best. Um, with powerful papers, and I want to just say thanks to, uh, to Lorenza and Michael, to Danny and Jack, to Manuel and Yemen and Cara and Oinya and Sarah. And uh, they, I think they all put tremendous uh, ideas out there, uh, very well constructed papers, did a lot of work in advance, uh, and for that we are really appreciative. Uh, as you saw, they all provided the text and we were able to produce the paper, or the book with the papers for everybody today. So uh, to everybody, uh, I have to, to all the speakers, I have to say a very, very sincere thank you because to you actually made this conference what it actually is. So thanks very much for that. Thank you. I think uh, the day was very special because of our keynote speaker, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Uh, that's an extraordinarily powerful presentation from him. Uh, he talked afterwards about the fact that this is, I think, the first in a series that he's going to do uh, in which he brought, brings together some, some serious ideas, uh, and that's the kind of foundation one as he, as he uh, sees it. Now, uh, for anybody who's interested, the presentations of all the presentations, including the President's, but all the other presentations as well, that were made today are already available on YouTube. And they will be available through our website uh, in the next day or two. As well as that, um, the uh, full text of the uh, President's address will also be on our website tomorrow. So if you want to sit again and uh, take a look and uh, listen and, uh, or watch the, the President again and with the text this time, uh, uh, you're obviously more than welcome. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But I want to say a very special thank you uh, to Finbar and the Kairos team uh, who put it all together and were with us uh, yesterday putting it together and uh, organizing it and then doing it all day today. And we really, really appreciate the professional uh, 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 sort of level of production that they have because I, I kept saying to people that when they were, hey, oh my God, you're going to live transmit this, and we were saying, yeah, and we're not doing it with our cameras, like we're, uh, our, our phones, the cameras on phones, right? They're like, this is a serious piece of work. And I, when, if you take a look at the, uh, at the actual YouTube, you'll see the professional nature of the presentation. So we're very, very grateful for that as well. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to Mick Clifford. Uh, he's been up here uh, in the spotlight and keeping order all day, and he's done a fantastic job, as always. Uh, and I, I think you, you, you add a, a whole layer yourself to it, Mick, and we really appreciate it. And we're very grateful for the fact that you come back again and again and again, and that you came back this year as well. Thank you. And finally, um, I want to say a very sincere thank you to everybody who stayed here and everybody who's stayed with us uh, in the live broadcast throughout the day. Um, it's, uh, it's been a long day, uh, with a lot of papers and a lot of discussion, heavy duty stuff, and yet people have persisted right through. So thank you all. You, we're always very happy to see you at our conferences. And uh, we, look, we, uh, we um, 
uh, look forward to seeing you again next time, next year. There's a couple of things. There's an evaluation we asked you to prepare. Uh, that's, that's very important. Uh, so you, if you could just maybe, if you haven't done so already, you might uh, fill it out for us. We actually do pay attention to these evaluations. Um, and the Social Justice Ireland um, AGM will take place in about 10, 15 minutes as soon as we can set it up <coughs> after this. Now, what have I forgotten? Oh my God, the cartoonist. Uh, the, uh, did, did, um, a very, very good job. Those of you who will um, have been passing in and out all day, every one of the presentations has been put into a cartoon and put up on the wall out there. We will have those on our website as well. And uh, they're becoming a bit of a signature for us as an organization. And uh, we use the, we're using them in different ways now. And um, it, doing a great job for us. So we really, really thank you as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> so with that, have I forgotten anything else? Hmm? Hmm? Then you? Ah, yeah, we will take that as given. They do a very, very good job. Uh, we like being in Croke Park. Uh, we like being here on other days as well. Not just today. Uh, and we've every intention of being back, by the way. That's another day's work. We we'll say nothing about it. <coughs> How many people were given out to me today? So I'll say nothing. Listen, uh, no problem. Great to have. Uh, uh, it's been a very great day. Thanks for being for all your participation, making it what it is. Thanks to the speakers. Thanks to Mick. Thanks to everybody who made it what it is, and uh, to our own staff, of course, as well, who who actually did the slogan to put it all together. Uh, we appreciate it all. Thank you very much.